Hey everyone, welcome to Future Proof, where I nerd out about classic sci-fi staples and their real-world counterparts. I'm your host, Michael Swang. That's right, Daniel O'Brien may have two Emmys, but I'm back doing videos on Cracked and making references from the early aughts, so who's really hashtag winning? Don't answer that. Teleportation, the big bamf, like walking but faster. Ever since primordial humans realized it sucks having to go places in order to get there, it's been a dream of ours to cut out the middleman and blink to wherever we want to be. Teleportation has appeared in many forms across pop culture, all of them cool, except for the Adjustment Bureau, which required you to wear a little teleportation hat, which is objectively very stupid. Even William Shakespeare invoked the concept in his final play, The Tempest. Whether you want to get to work faster or rob banks like in Jumper, teleportation is a handy answer. But what form of teleportation makes the most sense and how realistic is the tech? Will we ever achieve this impossible dream? Did I just spoil the answer by including the word impossible? To find out, let's dig through some prime examples of transporter fiction. One of the first depictions of modern teleportation was in 1958's The Fly, remade in 86 by David Cronenberg. In both versions of The Fly, transporting can only be done from one pre-built pod to another, which raises the question, don't you have to haul the other pod wherever you wanted to go first, and doesn't that kind of defeat the purpose? Fortunately, we never have to tackle that conundrum, since things go sideways immediately when a rogue bug gets into the pod at the crucial moment, and man is fused with insects, like army men in a microwave. In the original, this results in two distinct creatures, a fly with the tiny head of a man and a man with the head of a giant fly. In the remake, the hapless scientist in question is instead melded with a fly at the genetic level into a single grotesque being. Why Jeff Goldblum wasn't also melded with his own clothes or the air in the pod, none can say. My point is, and I think we can all get behind this, Jeff Goldblum should have been butt-ass naked for the entirety of the fly. Accidentally melding with someone or something is only one of many kinds of classic transporter accidents which can result in anything from a duplicate to an evil twin to a trip to a parallel universe. Frankly, even the fictional versions sometimes seem like more trouble than they're worth, except maybe The Circuit from 1976's Logan's Run, which exists solely to connect people for the purposes of casual sex like some kind of sci-fi Craigslist. The main thing they all mostly have in common is a vertical shaft of bright light and a range limited enough to make it so you'll still need spaceships. Because who doesn't want spaceships in their thing? One notable exception is a Stargate, which links distant worlds together with a series of portals. Stargates seem to have no range limit as long as you dial the right planet's number. There's even a reference to teleportation in Star Wars A New Hope, although we never see a functioning transporter in the series. Could have made evacuating Alderaan an option, just saying. At one point, Luke suggests that C-3PO teleport them off Tatooine, implying the idea at least exists in the Star Wars universe, if only as the idle daydream of a lowly nerf herder. Is there anything I might do to help? Well, not unless you can alter time, speed up the harvest, or teleport me off this rock. I don't think so, sir. Perhaps the most iconic teleporter is Star Trek's, but it was only included in the first place as a cost-saving measure. Because beaming people up and down is an easier effect to accomplish than a shuttlecraft landing, the device became a staple of the series, and thenceforth threatened to break the plot nearly every episode like any thriller written after the invention of cell phones. After all, if you can beam anyone or anything anywhere, why not just beam your enemies directly into space? Or half of your enemy across the room? Or yourself to Ryza, the sex planet? To address this, Trek constantly put limits on their transporter, not allowing it to function through raised shields or in the presence of a dampening field or radioactive interference, for instance. This sort of teleporter, much like in The Fly, and even the Mike TV part of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, functions by completely breaking down a person's body, cataloging their every atom, and beaming that information to another location where they can be reassembled. One interesting quirk of this idea is the fact that the person leaving the transporter need not be the same person as the one that entered the other end. It would be functionally the same, and frankly more efficient, to simply incinerate the person being transported and materialize a clone in their place. Hmm. Fortunately for all of us who don't like to be incinerated, this version of teleportation technology seems especially infeasible. In the physics of Star Trek, physicist Lawrence Krauss explains a transporter's theoretical data storage needs outstrip all methods of recording information. Not only that, but the computational time required to correctly reassemble a mess of discombobulated atoms 
atoms would stretch on for several times the age of the universe, and the energy required would amount to more energy than the universe holds. Yes, that's how complex you are at the atomic level. Feels good, doesn't it? This boils down to a few scientific realities, the first being the uncertainty principle, which says that we can't know a subatomic particle's exact position and speed at the same time. Without that information, assembling the puzzle into a person becomes essentially impossible. Then there's those pesky laws of thermodynamics, which say that you need to put more energy into a system than you take out of it. In this house, we obey the laws of thermodynamics. To convert the entire mass of a relatively small person into pure energy would produce the energy equivalent of over 100 million atomic bombs, and it would take a similar amount of energy to unscramble the results. I don't know if you've priced 100 million atomic bombs lately, but it gets up there. Then of course, there's more supernatural and magical forms of teleportation, like Nightcrawler from the X-Men or the protagonist from the Dishonored and Deathloop video games. All of these folks have to be able to see the spot they're going to warp to making their arch nemeses corners and workmen walking by with big boards. Last but not least, we can't forget the game Portal itself, which mimics the wormhole theory of teleportation. In this version, two points linked in space become one, like your parents' genitals the night you were conceived. No beaming required, as long as you're comfortable folding space and violating the laws of nature. But believe it or not, something akin to teleportation has been observed in the real world. The key difference is it's only happening at the quantum level, and it involves the instantaneous movement of information, not matter. If you're unfamiliar, quantum physics deals with the very, very small, things much smaller than atoms, where the traditional rules of engagement tend to go out the subatomic window. One miraculous property of quantum particles is their propensity to become entangled in such a way that their respective states are connected functionally. So if one spins one way, the other spins the other way, for example. And this remains true even over great distances. You can take two entangled particles, send them millions of miles apart, but if the spin of one quantum particle is affected, its entangled partner immediately shifts to match, meaning the information was transmitted between them instantaneously. Einstein called this effect spooky action at a distance which sounds like something you'd need to get a restraining order for. For similar effect, imagine randomly taking either an ace of spades or hearts and giving the other one to a partner. No matter how far away you got from one another, the second you flipped over your card, you'd know what card your partner had. It's not gonna help you rob a bank or even win a hand of poker, but it's still pretty cool. A separate phenomenon known as quantum tunneling involves another unique property of very tiny things, which is that they can behave as a wave rather than a traditional particle. This means, among other things, that the position of a quantum particle is more like a cloud of probabilities than a distinct localization. Because of this, there's a non-zero chance that a quantum particle can exist on the other side of a barrier that it traditionally shouldn't be able to penetrate, like a little tunnel. Very little. So little, the human mind can barely conceive of it. Admittedly, neither quantum entanglement nor tunneling will help you defeat GLaDOS or get an away team off the surface of a hostile planet, but they sure are a lot less dumb than a little teleporter fedora. I hate you so much, Adjustment Bureau. And hey, speaking of hate, that's what I hope you don't this video. Give me a like and a comment letting me know what sci-fi staples you'd like to see me tackle next, and I'll see you next time on Future Proof.